the war-torn skies of Europe with Hitler's mighty Luftwaffe. Messerschmitt's ME-163 Comet, a rocket-powered fighter that lived up to its name, the Comet was the fastest combat aircraft of the Second World War. With Allied bombers laying waste to German cities, the Nazis desperately searched to stem the tide. What they found was a revolutionary war machine that carried men closer to the sound barrier than ever before. Tonight, fly with the elite airmen of the Third Reich on wings of the Luftwaffe. General George S. Patton said that wars may be fought with weapons, but they are won by men. Those sentiments were probably of little comfort to the first Allied flyers to face Messerschmitt's ME-163 Comet. With a top speed of 620 miles an hour, the Comet lived up to its name and was the fastest aircraft of the Second World War. Now, 40 years later, the guns are silent and the world is a very different place. But at the RAF's Aerospace Museum in Cosford, this piece of history lives on. For although the regime the comet defended has long since perished, the technology it pioneered is now an integral part of modern life. The marriage of rocket power and a startling swept-wing design foretold the shape of things to come. Called the powered egg by the elite men chosen to fly it, the 163 is still the only rocket-powered fighter to go into combat. born during the First World War. Early on, field commanders sent aircraft aloft to get a better idea of what the enemy was up to. Soon after, fighters were developed to intercept these craft and bring them down. After the armistice, the Treaty of Versailles imposed severe restrictions on Germany's air force. Restrictions which in many ways brought them one step closer to the comet's technology. Alternative forms of propulsion like rocket power had not been mentioned in the treaty. At the time, rocketry just wasn't taken seriously. It was more of a slapstick promotional gimmick used to grab the attention of the anything goes public of the roaring twenties. In Europe and America, rockets were attached to just about everything imaginable. If you wanted people's attention, a rocket would make a big splash every time. In Germany, automobile tycoon Fritz von Opel sponsored the world's first successful rocket car in April 1928. The converted Opel racer was powered by Sander black powder rockets. Under the direction of rocket theorist Maximilian Ballier and driven by Kurt Volkart, the car reached 70 miles an hour. It was soon followed by the more streamlined Opel Rack 2, fitted with 24 Sander solid fuel rockets. In Berlin during May 1928, with Opel at the wheel, it reached its maximum speed of nearly 125 miles an hour. It needed inverse wings to hold it to the ground. There was little control of speed and limited endurance. But the huge cloud left behind created just the spectacle Opel wanted for the cameras. The Sander black powder rockets were developed from maritime life-saving rockets. Safe and controlled ignition was a rarity, however. Opel's team tried countering directional problems by building a rail-mounted car. The volatile rocket tubes were fairly primitive and housed together at the back of the vehicle. The car itself had to withstand extreme temperatures and was often scarred by their uneven and uncontrolled burning. The stunts were sheer spectacle and followed eagerly by the public. The scientific community, however, didn't share this enthusiasm. It seemed what was important was the publicity itself. The bigger the explosion, or more breathtaking the crash, the better the result.
Opel's rocket consultant, Maximilian Vallier, pursued experiments of his own. Through his writings on rocket space flight, Vallier enjoyed a popular following, but many of his exploits ended in disaster. The rocket was proving hard to tame. A stigma followed the rocket. The public saw it only as a silly advertising gimmick. Solid fuel rockets and their uncontrollability left many believing that rocketry and folly were one and the same. Reinhard Tilling's airmail delivery system was one among many postal rocket concepts. His device, full of mail, was blasted to a great height by solid fuel rockets. When it reached its zenith, wings would spring out and the rocket would float spiraling back to Earth. In Germany, with a little help from the newly empowered National Socialists, Gerhard Zucher demonstrated his large airmail rocket cylinder, which was stuffed with letters and postcards. The charred remnants inside never made it anywhere, and neither did the postal rocket concept. In Nazi Germany, a race of warriors was being bred, and young children were encouraged to learn aviation skills in government-backed model glider competitions. The boys became young men, and the gliders got bigger. Almost imperceptibly, a new generation of airmen embarked on its training. Finally, in 1935, Hitler presented the Luftwaffe to the world, audaciously renouncing the Treaty of Versailles. Now, new pilots and new technologies would rewrite the rules of aerial warfare. Along with the pilots that found their wings gliding, came a new generation of aircraft designers. Here, high in the Rhone Mountains, was the Wasserkupper, a resort established specifically for gliding. Before the First World War and long before Hitler's rise to power, this was the home of serious gliding in Germany. In the 20s, the sport swept the country. Gliders of all shapes took to the air here, high in central Germany. And of all the designers who came, Alexander Lippisch was one of the most innovative and respected. Pioneering both the low-drag tailless glider and the aerodynamic flying wing glider, his were some of the most exciting planes soaring into the skies. They would soon become of great interest to others than just avid followers of the sport. But in 1928, Fritz von Opel's passion switched from rocket cars to rocket flight. He'd encountered a problem never posed by his rocket cars. The tail surfaces of a conventional aircraft lay directly in the path of the rocket thrust. This little aircraft was designed with its tail set high. It was actually Opel's second rocket glider. Months before, he'd sought out a brilliant glider designer he'd heard about who was working on a tailless aircraft high in the Rhone Mountains. And so he came up there to our mountain resort and asked about this, whether we would have a plane which had no tail on it. He wanted to try a new engine. And I said, well, we have this Connor type, which has an elevator in front and nothing at the rear and we could use it for this. And so he came up in summertime with these rockets and we mounted the rockets on this thing, three rockets. And uh, Mr. Starmer, Fritz Starmer, who was at this time the instructor of our gliding school, he made the first flights with this rocket plane. But then we thought that uh, the reliability of the rockets wouldn't be too good at this time. I don't know whether it's too much better now. Lippisch's Enter became the first rocket-powered aircraft. Opel turned to a more conventional configuration for this, his next flight, but brought together Lippisch's tailless aircraft and the rocket in a connection that would have a profound effect on aviation history. Meanwhile, by 1930, Max Vallier began work on liquid-fueled rocket cars. 
Liquid fuels made rocketry much more feasible, with more control and greater endurance. But it was still dangerous. In May 1930, while observing a liquid fuel rocket motor in action, Valier was hit in the heart by a fragment when the motor exploded. He bled to death. The use of liquid propellants had many advantages, and solid fuel systems fell by the wayside. The Walter company created a system that ran on hydrogen peroxide. The Luftwaffe took great interest in this to assist bombers during takeoff. These rocket-assisted takeoff pods, or RATO units, would be used throughout the war. The work paid off when an experimental rocket-assisted Heinkel 112, originally meant to use liquid oxygen-based fuel, adopted Walter's motor instead. As confidence increased in the Walter motor, many felt that this auxiliary power unit had the potential to propel an aircraft entirely on its own. Churchill called World War II the Wizard War because for the first time such emphasis was placed on science. The essential part of the war today is the guy who has big glasses and a huge slide rule or computer figures out how you have to shoot this missile or what it is. In 1938, the clouds of war were gathering, and the Luftwaffe launched a new endeavor, the construction of a rocket-powered fighter. For this, the Walter rocket motor was chosen. The Walter motor had been refined and was now using improved fuel consisting of two ingredients. With the rocket engine well under development, Luftwaffe planners had to find an airframe for their new weapon. They turned to Lippisch. This is one of the test models built by Dr. Alexander Lippisch. A light, tailless fighter aircraft. Its radical nature did little to inspire enthusiasm. Many other people thought that we should uh, well, build uh, normal defenses, propeller-driven planes, and then Messerschmitt himself wasn't very much enthused about all this project. Even so, the concept was taken on by Messerschmitt, and the Luftwaffe sanctioned work on the first tailless rocket fighter. The model was known as the ME-163A. Project X had top security cover. These screens were to hide the Model A from prying eyes. The very first comet is wheeled into the hangar where Lippisch and his team worked for so many long months to prepare the little aircraft. Still, the maiden flight was postponed several times because the Walter rocket motor wasn't yet ready. Finally, in 1940, the famous German glider pilot Heine Dittmar, who'd flown many hours in Lippisch tailless aircraft, was ready to take the first comet into the air. The problem with rocket motors at the time was their limited endurance. On the one hand, there was tremendous thrust and an incredibly high rate of climb. On the other, it burned up all its fuel within minutes, relying solely upon gliding ability to get back down safely. small engine employed, the 163's maiden powered flights, completely vindicated Lippisch's aerodynamic theories. The sweeping wing, blending into the fuselage, handled superbly. As these trials proceeded, larger engines were already under development. They were to be powered by more advanced fuels. Confidence ran high. 
but there were fears. All of the valuable flight experience on this dangerous project was being invested in a single pilot, Dittmar. Given the Luftwaffe's increased enthusiasm for the ME-163 and the fact that there had been several near accidents, it's perhaps not surprising that demands were made that an additional pilot be found. Rudy Opitz, another glider champion, well respected by Lippisch, became the second man to fly the revolutionary machine. He found it a whole new experience. If you had a, a, a dish of, uh, of bean soup or, or something like that, uh, you were in trouble uh, because at that uh, high climb rate uh, you blew up like a balloon. We sent all our pilots uh, uh, to Germany's highest mountain. There was a, a hotel up there and uh, uh, we would have them there for, uh, for I think, three weeks uh, to get uh, adjusted to the altitude. Its high rate of climb was unique, but in many ways it handled like other planes of the day and was truly a pleasure to fly. The mainstay of Lippisch's basic concept, and perhaps a legacy of his glider designing days, was that the Comet should be as light as possible. To this end, the aircraft was never fitted with its own undercarriage, but rather relied on a dolly that was jettisoned just after takeoff, and the landing was executed on a retractable skid. The takeoff procedure was very risky because the dolly was known to bounce back and strike the bottom of the aircraft, possibly puncturing the tanks full of volatile fuel. It's very evident just why the 163 consumed so much fuel in such a short time. Uh, they wanted to fly it over a measured course. They had set up a, a course along the Baltic Sea with theodolites to uh, to see how fast it flies, because up to now, the first three flights were all climbing flights. During the speed test, the comet was towed to its release height, saving fuel exclusively for the run. Dittmar is in the 163, Opitz in the tow plane. This particular model was fitted with a 750 kilogram thrust engine, nearly twice as powerful as those used previously. Incredibly, the plane exceeded the magic mark of 1,000 kilometers an hour. But in doing so, the Model A was pushed beyond its design capabilities. It accelerated very fast to that uh, critical Mach, it, uh, and uh, it, it just went out of control. And fortunately for Dittmar, uh, when it went out of control, nose over, the negative uh, g-forces uh, shut off the fuel. The fortunate accident gave Dittmar control. The 163 was now the fastest aircraft ever. The veil of secrecy left Dittmar's achievement untold. Heine Dittmar's luck didn't last, however. He soon became the comet's first casualty. The seat was sitting direct off the structure of the very rigid structure for the skid that supports the skid. And there was no give. There was nothing but, but buckle or so. You sit without a cushion on that, on that seat. And when he came there, it, it was like a hammer. Here he was sitting in, in terrible pain. He couldn't move. The landing skid wouldn't lower. And the impact left him with a broken back. For now, Heine Dittmar was out of the program. In October 1941, the decision was made to turn the experimental ME-163 Comet into a combat fighter. Germany had been at war for two years and sorely needed a defense for the fatherland against swarms of Allied bombers. It would be some time before Germany would suffer punishing attacks of concentrated daytime bombing, but even the current toll taken on industry was far too high. Smaller factories could be hidden or even moved, 
but larger complexes like blast furnaces, chemical works, aviation factories, and ball bearing plants, vital to the Reich war effort, were vulnerable and utterly exposed. Plans were made to station the comet around high-risk targets, briefed to defend vigorously the plant or factory under its guard against flotillas of enemy bombers. By the middle of 1943, American daytime raids with up to a thousand bombers and as many as 700 escorts were punishing German industry daily. There was clearly no time to waste in getting the comet into action. The fighter version of the 163, the B model, was designed for simpler mass production and could carry more fuel than the Model A prototype. An ME-163B was flown at the end of the war by British Royal Navy test pilot Captain Eric Brown. We reacquainted him with the Imperial War Museum's comet in Duxford, England. Getting into the cockpit of this remarkable aircraft again after many, many years brings back a lot of memories. And I remember very, very well my first impression of ever seeing it. I was struck by how small it was and yet how elegant it looked and at the same time how very lethal. Lethal not only to the enemy but to those who flew it. Inside the cockpit you had on either side of you, just beside your legs, the two tanks holding the t off fuel. So you were really encased uh, in a cockpit, very small cockpit, with these two dangerous fuel tanks on either side of you. And indeed, once you were in flight, you were virtually in a metal coffin. When you lowered the skid and got the indication that it was down, you then had to return the lever to neutral. If you failed to do this, the skids would be, or the skid would be under compression and therefore you would have a solid landing bed with no cushioning at all. And this is what caused many, many pilots to break their backs in this aircraft. One of the amusing things is when we put it on show at the end of the war, many people came up and said, good heavens, is this the propeller that drives this aeroplane? But in fact, this is just a small propeller which drives a generator inside the nose of the aircraft to supply the electric power. As you lift it off, you jettisoned the trolley at about 15 feet off the ground. And the, this height was quite critical because if it wasn't correct, if you dropped it too high, you might get a very heavy bounce and the trolley could come up and hook itself onto the front of the skid. The other danger was it could actually come up and puncture the fuel tanks which were located in this area, each side of the pilot and in the wing. The wings, of course, are swept back, as you see, and this was a novel feature for us at this time. The sweep back here is not very acute. It's 23 degrees. But it was, of course, the thing that unlocked the way to supersonic flight. We have a fixed slot in the wing, which was, of course, to improve the stall and the maneuver, low-speed maneuver conditions. As you go along, you'll see we have a, a skid under the wingtip. Now, as the aircraft landed, it would slow down to, and at about 40 miles an hour, it would be too slow for the pilot to be able to hold the wings up on ailer. So eventually, one wing or the other was going to drop onto the ground, and this was to take the weight of the contact. But in spite of this, the aircraft never slewed to either side. It ran absolutely dead straight, even with the wing on the ground. There is no tail unit, Ed, other than the vertical tail unit, of course, pin and the rudder, but there are no elevators or tailplane as such. And we have here 
LA bonds. In other words, the elevator and the Ellen control are incorporated together to work differentially. Allied fighters had a rate of climb of the order of three to three and a half thousand feet a minute. This thing, when it got going, actually had a rate of climb of the order of 14,000 feet a minute. And so you were talking about a startling quantum jump in the matter of climb performance. I've flown in my time five tailless aircraft, and the other four were all killers, frankly. This is the only one that had good flight characteristics. And I think because of this, it started a lot of enthusiasm for the tailless design. But nobody quite ever got it right, like Alexander Lippisch managed to get it right on the 163. Neither the Americans nor the British ever produced a tailless plane equal to the Comet. The first Combat 163s were ready for their tryout flights by February of 1944, and by the end of the year almost 230 were delivered. Getting them into action was another story, because every aspect of the plane and its operation was new to ground crews and pilots alike. It was a daunting endeavor. The pilots even had to wear special overalls to protect them from the fuel. The Comet was anything but conventional, and men flying the plane had to be intimate with its peculiarities. Even bailing out of the aircraft was by no means easy. And the canopy would float one inch over the frame. It wouldn't blow off. It flew in the boundary layer of the aircraft. And it went through all maneuvers and it came down and hadn't gotten rid of the canopy. And when it came to a stop, the canopy fell off. And we took a broomstick along to try to push up the, the nose section of the canopy to, to make it get it out of the slipstream and make it break off. Although it wasn't yet in combat operation, the Luftwaffe had a precise plan for their swift little plane. And in protecting vital installations sure to be targeted by the Allies, their role would be crucial. Still terribly limited in range, the Comets had a flight radius of a mere 25 miles and a maximum 10 minutes flight time. In fact, fully one third of their fuel supply was consumed simply in getting off the ground. The remainder was burnt as the aircraft rose at over 80 yards a second. When it reached its operational height, the Comet had less than two and a half minutes to intercept enemy planes. It was a handicap. Yet the plane's great speed also meant that within five minutes of scrambling, 163s were diving through Allied bomber formations. After a few swift passes, the attack was over. With no fuel, the Comet would simply glide back to base. This unpowered descent was a time of great vulnerability. With no second chance at landing and no power to avoid enemy fighters. Experienced pilots could come in steep and fast to avoid any lurking fighters, but the inexperienced would have to fly a long, slow approach. This was the window of opportunity for Allied aircraft to pick the Comet off. Mobile recovery units, known as shoe schleppers, were always on hand to remove the landed Comet quickly. Without them, the aircraft, completely immobile, was a sitting duck for prowling Allied fighters. The Schuschlepper's arms lifted the Comet onto a small centerline track and hauled it away safely. And while the relentless American bombing attacks went on, swift recovery meant that a Comet could fly several missions a day sometimes within the span of an hour or so. 
Back at base, the ground crew would jack up the aircraft and the detachable dolly was fitted under the skid. These robust dollies were tailored for each individual aircraft and had to be thoroughly inspected before being used again. But the next step was the most dangerous. A single mistake in refueling the 163 would cost lives, so the strictest procedures were followed. Of nearly 300 ME-163Bs built, more were lost in fuel explosions than by hostile fire. First, the fuel tanks and any plumbing where the traces of fuel might still remain were completely flushed out. In fact, the tanks always held a small amount of unused fuel. The flushing process was absolutely vital because by now the Comet had an advanced engine which used two types of fuel, C-stoff and T-stoff. Extremely volatile, these chemicals demanded great caution. When the tanks were fully topped off with water, compressed air was shot into the fuel system to ensure that every crevice was washed. Only then was the water released. The next job required even more caution. Refueling the 163 was taken one step at a time. The two fuels, T-stoff and C-stoff, were difficult to tell apart, so everything was very clearly labeled. First, the C-stoff, a hydrazine hydrate and methanol fuel mixture, was carefully pumped into its separate tank. During the entire process, plenty of water was kept running to neutralize any spillage. The fuels were so volatile that many comets simply exploded on the runway. When the sea stop was loaded, the ground crew washed off anything that might have come into contact with the toxic fuel. Only when the C-stoff tanker was well clear of the aircraft did the truck containing T-stoff approach. T-stoff was basically hydrogen peroxide and as a precaution was handled by entirely different service personnel. The reason for these strict procedures was quite simple. If even the smallest amounts of the two chemicals came into contact, the results could be disastrous. I would say the handling of the fuel was not too difficult. How powerful was this fuel? I'm exposing some guy on your head. Yeah, well, then you burn. If you stick your finger in it, then you get only the bone out. It was that... Uh... Oh, yeah, that is like a very high concentrated acid. Yeah. The fuel was so corrosive that pilots had to wear special flying suits impregnated with neoprene. And even this provided only limited protection. T-stoff was the really dangerous element. If it came into contact with organic material, it would ignite. As Opitz found out, his 163 slid into a ditch on landing and leftover fuel leaked into the cockpit. Some of it penetrated his gloves and made contact with his hands. It was his skin that did the igniting. I, I was in flames. My hand was burning in... Because the uh, gloves, it had soaked through the fabric and when it touched the skin, it burst into flames. And the, the, uh, the fabric, uh, just nylon, if it gets hot, it cakes. You couldn't get it off.
One of the greatest setbacks the 163 program encountered was a freak accident involving Germany's famous woman pilot, Hanna Reich, whose aviation exploits had made her a national heroine. In October 1942, Reich used her prestige to get a flight in the 163. But the dolly didn't detach properly and she was injured when she made a forced emergency landing in a nearby field. It was a potentially fatal blow to the program. I proved that nothing is wrong. I attached a, a dolly to it, fixed that it couldn't come up. <laughs> I flew it, and I landed it, and, uh, and, and this was necessary to get the program going, because he, she was such a very uh, highly regarded person that something happened to her uh, uh, that is not worth the, the program, and it, it, it could kill the program. The Comet program survived Hannah Reich's accident, but in spite of Lippisch's continued success, his relationship with Messerschmitt deteriorated, and he soon moved to Austria, but never lost his fascination with flight. His fertile mind continued to delve into the many realms of aviation. By the middle of 1945, American daytime bombing was tearing the heart out of German industry. The cry went up to waste no more time before getting the comet into action. They considered uh, our training flights a waste because they felt every time uh, there were all those aircraft flying in and, and bombing the, the country to pieces and here they were sitting on the ground and using the very precious fuel for training flights because it was war and they felt uh, they are ready to go after a couple flights. As the bombing escalated, the vital installations necessary to German survival were strained to the limit. Deprived of them, the Reich would be broken. The time for the comet's debut had finally and urgently arrived. Since we could climb with the military version of the plane in two minutes to about 33,000 and stay up there, and make probably two or three passes. A large number of these planes would certainly made it very difficult to attack at daytime with bomber uh, units. In their tight box formations, American four-engine bombers were easy prey. Uh, our factories and our supplies and all our well, railroad lines and all this would have stayed intact. Well, that means that uh, you have more possibility to survive. I knew for myself, I mean, I knew it in 41, that the war basically was lost. You think it would have been lost? In, uh, irretrievably lost even with your oh, plane? Yeah, I think we could only survive. With the daily toll taken by Allied bombing becoming fatally high, the Luftwaffe selected large potential targets difficult to relocate, such as steelworks and oil refineries, for protection by 163 squadrons. By July 1944, they were fully operational. Situated close to their assigned installations, 163s were kept in constant readiness, sometimes with their pilots even waiting in the cockpit for the call to arms. By the end of 1944, over 230 comets had been produced, and many of these were already on active duty. The problem the Luftwaffe's conventional interceptors faced in combating American bomber formations was accurately predicting where and when they were going to strike. And even when they guessed correctly, it could take half an hour to get there, by which time the damage was done. Comet had no such problem. Like a spider in its web, it just sat, waiting for the drone of the B-17s. On the go signal, everything happened very quickly. Within three minutes, they could be at over 30,000 feet 
with several minutes of fuel left to use in attacking the bombers. Its great speed and small size made it an impossible target for American gunners. By the same token, their speed worked against them, because 163 pilots actually had difficulty training their own cannon on the aircraft they stalked. The 30 millimeter gun fired so slow that if you were out of phase, a B-17 could fly between the bullets, just like you shoot a machine gun through the propeller. Once this lightning attack was finished, Comet pilots faced the most dangerous part of the mission, the gliding descent back to base. Without power, they had only one chance to land safely. And in the process of getting down, they were defenseless against prowling Allied fighters. The bomber formation came in with fighter escorts. And though there was no safe level anymore, now when you came down uh, to the airport and uh, you set up a pattern and you go back to pattern speed, say at, uh, at, uh, at 5,000 feet, you come over the field and you slow the aircraft down and try to land, uh, you are an easy prey for fighter pilots who just wait outside the airport and wait till you come back. But their effect on the fortunes of war, like all the German wonder weapons, was too little and too late. By then, the Third Reich was far too enveloped by defeat's embrace for anything to save it. The comet never came close to altering the course of the war. But in many other ways, Lippisch's brilliant design did have a tremendous effect on the course of aviation history and modern life itself. The X-planes of the post-war period, a vital link in man's quest into space, were utterly reliant on rocket power. And like the comet, they too glided back to Earth following burnout. The supersonic airline of the Concorde can trace its lineage directly back to Lippisch's work with the Delta Wing configuration. He's recognized as the father of the Delta Wing. An even greater parallel with the 163's flight profile is the Space Shuttle. This tailless, delta-wing craft uses phenomenal rocket power to soar beyond the atmosphere itself before gliding back to Earth. After the war, Lippisch went to America, where his genius was well recognized. In 1965, he founded the Lippisch Research Corporation. The man and his work were inseparable. Even in quiet moments with his family, his passion for flight burned deep inside him. Only extinguished in 1976 by his death.